Well, the situation in Egypt certainly historic, but what was the straw that broke the camel's back? The factor that led people to cry for revolution. A lot of people out there, well, they say it's simple. It was poverty and hunger. Some even look as far back as 2008, when the number of hungry and food insecure people in the world increased by 250 million. At the time, it was deemed the global food crisis, and everyone speculated on what could have caused it. A rise in oil prices, increased demand in India, drought in China. But one man is pointing his fingers at speculation itself, and mostly at Goldman Sachs. Earlier, I spoke with Frederick Kaufman, contributing editor for Harper's Magazine. He also wrote this article, a short, this book, A Short History of the American Stomach. He told me how this rise in food prices came about. In 1991, Goldman Sachs came up with a new financial derivative for the uh, commodity markets, and that was called the Long Only Index Fund. And this was a new kind of investment that was made for people who wanted to put a lot of money in commodities and just let it sit there for a long time and let it grow. And this is really not how the commodity markets have worked. Really what you have are physical, spe uh, physical speculators and hedgers moving in and out of positions along with the seasons as the wheat comes and goes. But Goldman Sachs put together this new idea, this long only index fund, where they would simply buy and keep buying no matter what the market conditions. In other words, if the price of wheat went up in the past, people would sell at that point. Goldman would continue to buy. And they made this derivative product work very well for themselves over its first 10 years of existence. And then around 2003, 2004, 2005, when certain other fundamentals changed in the world economy, a lot of money started pouring into these commodity index funds. And what we're seeing today uh, are the effects of the fact that now speculators are outnumbering the physical hedgers by about four to one in these markets. And you know, I was kind of doing some research on this. I found an old article about the food crisis written back in April 2008, and it said corn doubled in price over the last two years. Wheat's, wheat reached its highest price in 28 years. The increases are already sparking unrest from Haiti to yeah. Egypt. And that was back in 2008. Is it possible that things got so bad that part of what we're seeing in Egypt right now was actually fueled by hunger? Absolutely. I mean, what we've seen are food riots in more than 60 countries over the past two years. And in Egypt, really, over the past several months, uh, the citizens there have seen uh, inflation rates of 17% per month in the price of food. And so, of course, if uh, all of a sudden you have middle class people, young people who no longer can afford uh, protein for themselves, they can't afford f fresh vegetables for themselves, middle class parents can't afford to feed their children milk. This is when people get very angry. This is when people take to the streets. Clearly this is a part of the, a part of the whole. There's no question we had regime change in Haiti because of this. I think it's uh, really interesting, the stuff that you are, are telling us about Goldman Sachs and, I mean, just how they continue to buy, even though prices weren't going up, confusing the population. This seems absurd to the average person that this type of thing can happen. Uh, I mean, aren't there regulations in place to prevent these artificial speculations from happening, both in commodities and other areas as well? Uh, absolutely. There were regulations in place since uh, this country's Great Depression, but of course there was this mania of deregulation throughout the 1990s. And finally, by the end of the 90s, there were exceptions made, not for the people in the commodity business, but for people in the banking business. Uh, certain banks were allowed to take huge positions in commodities that they were never before allowed to take. And of course, this is what happens. The markets are now being controlled by imaginary wheat. Imaginary wheat being bought and sold by financial giants is controlling the price of, uh, of real wheat. And so what we're actually seeing is we're seeing an issue in the world right now where there are constraints on supply. I mean, there's no question that in China and the United States and Russia and Argentina and Australia, around the world, there have been constraints on the wheat supply and on grain supply at the same time. Clearly, as, as, as a lot of people have argued, there's, there's demand, uh, demand issues, such as the, the growing demand for meat and uh, throughout India and the middle class in, in China. Added to this, however, and really spiking this whole thing, is this 
tremendous buy pressure brought on by the banks who are seeing, well, in a world climate where people are generally distrusting currency, they're distrusting dollars, dollars are being printed like crazy, they're distrusting euros, they're distrusting pounds. What is the classic hedge? What is the classic flight to safety? Commodities. And so we have this flight to safety, we have the supply and demand issues, plus we have this kind of market subverting long only index fund. And so what we're getting are these insane price spikes and it's a vicious circle because of course the farmers themselves aren't making any money from this because they're losing their shirts because even as they're selling grain for more, all of their inputs are costing more. Their diesel is costing more. Their fertilizer is costing more. They're not winning. The middlemen aren't winning. The Coca-Colas and the Domino's Pizza, even the Giants, they're not winning either because they're getting killed for the price of their inputs. Who's winning? Right, you got it. Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase, the largest holders, the largest financial dealers in this, they're doing very well. Gosh, it seems crazy that they're always the winner, no matter what game uh, they seem to be playing. And thanks so much, uh, Frederick Kaufman. Um, very interesting article that you wrote for Harper's, even it was a year ago, uh, but still very, very valid today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Global Government News. Today is Saturday, February 12, 2011, and I'm Darko. Welcome, everyone, to this Economic News Bulletin. We're going to have this uh, news segment here in about two, maybe three videos. Um, we have a lot of news to get to. Uh, you just heard about the uh, rising food prices and how, of course, Goldman Sachs, just like everything else, is profiting from it, just like the housing market, just like BP oil crisis. And we have here Dow reaches two and a half year high, and it says stocks climb to a two and a half year closing high after Egyptian President Hazi Mubarak stepped down. And I cover these uh, the stock. Uh, basically uh, what uh, the stock market is doing uh, uh, briefly, very briefly, uh, because it's mostly speculation as we were, as you were just uh, heard, and uh, it's not based off real long-term investment. So it is a rigged game, and so that's why I don't go uh, into um, all of the little details about the stock market going up and down because it's always the same people that really win. It's not the little investor uh, who's making 50000 a year who has a little stock portfolio. It's Goldman Sachs. So uh, that's who wins in the end. And um, here we go. We're going to keep moving. Stocks rally and oil falls as uh, Mubarak seeds power. And then we have this. European stocks rise a second week as earnings top estimates and swatch gains. And uh, we have this, Canadian currency strengthens, and then European stocks rise a second week as earnings top estimates. And we covered that already. Asian currencies fall as global funds reduce holdings on growth concerns. OPEC, OPEC pumps more crude as demand to hit record. It says it has boosted its oil output to a, a two-year high encouraged by rising global demand and prices above $100 a barrel while the industrialized World's energy advisor said the increase may limit price gains. And then we have U.S. oil falls to 10-week low as Mubarak steps down. Uh, gas prices, we have gas prices hit their highest level ever for mid-February. So here we go. Uh, that's why I like to cover um, uh, different sources along with um, uh, the very latest news. And then, you know, any, anywhere from a, we, uh, a half a week to a week old because uh, it gives you uh, the bigger picture of uh, uh, what's really going on here. It says U.S. gasoline prices have jumped to the highest level ever for the middle of February. The national average hit $3.12 per gallon on Friday, about 50 cents above a year ago. The price is about 6% higher uh, than on this date in 2008. The next day, pump prices began a string of 32 gains over 34 days. They rose 39% over five months eventually hitting an all-time high of $4.11 per gallon in July, said although gas prices are expected to rise, most experts aren't expecting a reprise of 2008 when the price spike uh, forced many drivers to join carpools and trading gas-guzzling SUVs. And uh, says, it would be a mistake to think we're going to have it all over again, says Opus Chief Oil Analysis Tom Kloza. Well, we're getting conflicted reports, especially when you get it uh, from sources such as uh, you know, the companies themselves say it ain't so. Former Shell boss predicts $5 gasoline. I covered an article just a week ago about uh, another oil individual uh, saying that we're going to have $5 gasoline by 2012. And it says here, former president and CEO of Shell, uh, John Hoffmeister, has some interesting things to say about where prices of oil could go in the next year or so. And said, according to Hoffmeister, despite oil's recent price slip, there's a huge and growing demand just below the surface. 
much of it uh, from emerging markets. He says that the United States production lower than levels uh, of 1970 and 80s prices will rise in the spring. That was weird the way they worded that. He sees gasoline prices reaching as high as $5 per gallon, but he says the most telling part of his comments concern what he calls the over-reliance of energy estimates on our energy reserves. Uh, he quoted the 20 million barrels of U.S. oil demand per day and noted that while every estimate uh, cities or sites, sorry, abundant reserves, the total is actually around 37 million barrels, just two days worth. So he says that if the price of oil runs as high as he thinks it will, this demand reserve uh, scenario coupled with what he called the ridiculous energy policies of the administration could well result in another recession. So there you go. Fuel protests reach Britain Treasury. Protesters against fuel price rise in Britain have taken their anger to HM Treasury on Whitehall, led by TV presenter Quentin Wilson. Then we have trade gap in U.S. widens for the second straight month as oil imports increase. Treasury yields reach highs on better economic growth, U.S. debt auctions. Then we have cotton at an all-time high. Cotton has just been skyrocketing. It says uh, cotton prices hit an all-time high, edging towards $2 a pound and raising the question of whether the fire soaring costs will cool demand rise in sugar costs hit uh, Cosin Profits. The world's largest sugar and ethanol group said Thursday that the net income fell 83% and the quarter ended December 31st, mainly due to rising costs as its uh, sugar operations. Then we have Mexico loses corn crop to cold. Now remember, they're losing their corn crops to the cold. This is Mexico, closer to the equator. I'm not a geographer, a geologist, or anything like that, but I think Mexico is closer to the equator than us, so which would mean that they would have a, a warmer climate. So this would be unusual. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Mexico rejects Monsanto's GMO corn. So see, when you have this crap happening, right, then you get this crap, uh, Monsanto coming in and trying to push GMO corn on the Mexican people. Then we have Cuba bread running short at bakeries. Entrepreneurs may be buying up flour in the black market, causing bread shortages. Indonesians furious about soaring chili prices. Then Cisco, Cisco is a, a pretty big uh, globalist company, declares force mahur raises grocery prices. Not sure if I pronounced that word right. Food inflation driven by freezing weather into Florida. Oh, freezing weather in Florida. Now that must be normal as well. I'm telling you guys, I'm learning something new every day. Freezing in Texas, uh, freezing weather in Texas, uh, basically they had to get uh, utility electricity uh, uh, pumping from uh, from Mexico. And of course the White House said it was due to cold temperatures, but that's not re what it really was. It was due to Obama's uh, policies, green uh, policies. So anyways, food inflation driven by freezing weather in Florida during uh, December in Mexico during February is hitting the U.S. supermarkets. In the coming days, Cisco sent out an alert that announced an act of God to address their contracted supply issues. Talking about a cold snap to hit Texas, see, Texas and Mexico, destroying fresh produce crops. And it says here, your restaurants will be low on fresh produce for weeks, and they will have to raise prices significantly or cut uh, produce out of the menu. So, wow, that is a pretty big story. Uh, as Stalin starved Ukrainians, children turn into cannibals, says Louis Lafham. You can check out that. Uh, just uh, some pretty, pretty scary stuff here. And uh, it says here, uh, when the Kharkiv orphanage filled with starving, moaning orphans suddenly went silent, caregivers rushed in to find the children eating Petrus. The smallest of them, some tore off bits of the boy's flesh and devoured them while others sucked blood from his wounds. And it goes in here and it talks about 1933 in Soviet Ukraine and the widespread famine was a result of forced collectivization. Even as his people died from hunger, Stalin exported grain. Hmm, what does that sound like? Sounds like what? I think it was Mao, Mao in China? He did the same thing with the Great Leap Forward. People were starving, Chinese people, and they were still exporting a lot. And he said he regarded the starving peasants as reactionary saboteurs of the socialist economy. So, we're going to keep moving. China seeks to ease food fears. So, uh, and we go to this. China spends $1 billion to fight massive drought wrecking countries' wheat crops. So, for a country that touts um, their weather modification ability, their ability to create rain, that's what their big specialty is in, in the weather modification uh, complex, is to create little rain droplets. They use, quote, silver iodide to do it, right? And um, they still can't get a grip or get a hold on this drought. So uh, maybe that will be their solution to keep spraying and spray more. 
Why don't Americans believe in global warming? Hmm, that's pretty interesting. Well, I wonder why, because uh, we just got hit by a humongous blizzard, and if you say snow has nothing to do with uh, with uh, global warming or global cooling, well then how about the uh, Mexican crops that were destroyed and all the animals that are dying due to cold weather? But the whole purpose of this article is because the Americans don't want a carbon tax. So, anyways, join us in part two of this GGN Economic News.